This week was a wild. We got our guy, Brees Hall, fully taking over. We, we have Jalen Waddle. Obviously, we need to talk about him for just a bit, but we'll get into them later on in this video. Before we do it, go down there, drop a like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already, and please go to the comment section. I haven't asked this from y'all yet. I wanted to give a little bit of time. Go to the comment section, not the premiere chat, the comment section so I can check it later. What is your record? I know you're playing in a multitude of leagues. The main league you care about, the main fantasy football league you're in, whether that's your highest stakes league, your league with your high school buddies, let me know what your record is. Let's see where the flock is overall. And of course, if you have any other questions, you can leave them down there in that comment section. Last but not least, this video is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Of course, when you go check out any player prop on Underdog Fantasy, make your first deposit with the link in the comment section or in the description of the video promo code flock. They're going to match it dollar for dollar up to 100. And this week, at least Monday night, one of my favorite lines Go take the under. Darren Waller, five receptions. I don't know how this is here. I mean, L, do they not know Hunter Renfro is coming back? But that should be it. Let's go through. Let's dive into our top 10 lessons learned. And let's start it off with the Thursday night game. Super brief. We already talked about this, but I want to hammer it in. Russell Wilson, garbage. Matt Ryan, garbage. Now, where do we go going forward? I think that Jerry Judy is... Probably a borderline flex play as well as Cortland Sutton. Y'all know we were saying to sell Sutton last week. Not someone we like coming into the season. Sutton's no longer a guaranteed starter. And going over to Indianapolis, we are looking at this all the time. I mean, Alec Pierce was the wide receiver one. He will be someone on our waiver wire video. But you can't start him. Just yeah, I think maybe Michael Pittman's a borderline flex play. It is disgusting. Let me know what you think of these overall offenses. Now, going over to our next disgusting spot, we got a lot of hate in the live streams this week for going through, and I was walking on eggshells. I didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Going out there to talk about Jared Goff not maintaining his spot as one of the top quarterbacks in fantasy, that he was a sell-high guy, and who would have known? Jared Goff is Jared Goff. I mean, 229 passing yards, Zero passing touchdowns and an interception. The Detroit Lions go from being literally the highest scoring offense in the NFL to giving you nothing. I mean, once the Monroe St. Brown was ruled good to go, I thought a Monroe St. Brown was the must-start guy. I thought that Jamal Williams was a must-start guy. We know DeAndre Swift. I think this is going to open up a buy-low moment for St. Brown, though. Like, St. Brown, don't you worry. We are going to be buying him low in a couple weeks. Now, our next lesson learned, going over to London. I don't know if we can confidently start any Green Bay Packer receiver. Now, I know your reaction is going to be, well, Mason, um, Alan Lazard had a fine day. I played Alan Lazard. He gave me 13 and a half points. I'm good. I'm chilling. Well, in reality, if we're going through, if we're looking at the overall target volume in Green Bay, you have Randall Cobb, 13 targets. And please do not tell me you're starting Randall Cobb going forward. Like, do not think that you could start Randall Cobb. Looking at Alan Lazard, looking at Romeo Dobbs. I mean, I wasn't a massive Dobbs guy coming into the week because we were saying, hell, with a healthy Alan Lazard, with Christian Watson also hopefully healthy, of course, he goes down with the hamstring. But still, this is going to be a Green Bay Packers offense where everything is spread out among these top guys. I mean, I think it may have been even grosser here if it wasn't for the Christian Watson hamstring injury. It's going to be spread out. Aaron Rodgers is not what we have seen from him in years past. So I don't know if you can start a single Green Bay Packers wide receiver unless this room thins itself out. But now going over, looks like Ramadre Stevenson may be a straight-up league winner now. We'll talk about Najee Harris later on. But I owe a couple people an apology in the live stream because we had multiple people come out to the live stream this week and go, are we starting Ramondre Stevenson or Najee Harris? And every time we had that question, I went, yes, Ramondre Stevenson, great running back in a lead offensive line in one of the best matchups you can find going up against the Detroit Lions, if not the best matchup you can find. But in a full BBR format, we probably still have to go Najee, knowing that he's going to get every touchdown of his backfield. Damian Harris 
is clearly going to be a factor in here in New England. Well, that call was laughably wrong for a couple of different reasons. We'll talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers offense in a bit. But looking at Ramondre Stevenson, 25 carries, 161 rushing yards, and also a couple targets out of the backfield, a couple of receptions. Now, clearly, you had the injury for Damian Harris. Damian Harris only playing six snaps before going down. I will say going forward, I don't think that you can just assume that Ramondre Stevenson plays every single snap as he did. I mean, if we were looking at this out of the 60 potential snaps he could have played, he played 54. Like, he played 100% of the snaps post Damian Harris injury, but they have Pierre Strong. They have J.J. Taylor. I think they are going to call him up to be on the active roster. I think they are going to be playing next week. At least one of these guys will be in a running back by committee. But clearly, Pierre Strong is not Damian Harris. So I think that you should probably expect Ramondre Stevenson to go from being a maybe 50-50 back in this backfield to going to a 75-25 split. And clearly, he'll be playable in that context. Now going over to the Buffalo Bills, we have a couple takeaways. Like we've been discussing, I mean, uh, Gabriel Davis has a very high ceiling. Looks like if you are attached to this uh, Buffalo Bills offense, this Bills offense that can put up 50, 40 points at will, you at least borderline have to be in consideration to be thrown in the flex. Borderline consideration for the flex at the minimum. Gabriel Davis only had six targets today. So six targets, you're sitting here going, Okay, well, it's not too much. Who really cares? Well, just like week one when he only had five targets, with those six targets, he dominated. You had Gabriel Davis, six targets, three receptions, 179 receiving yards, a couple of receiving touchdowns as well. If you're in this Buffalo Bills offense and you're a pass catcher, I think that you are 100% worth at least considering Jamin in the starting lineup. Obviously, you're playing Gabriel Davis no matter what. This is more so looking at Isaiah McKenzie, who should probably be coming back next week from the concussion. But going over to Pittsburgh, you had a couple different things happen. First off, Kenny Pickett looks very bad. Kenny Pickett, 52 passing attempts, a whopping zero, zero passing touchdowns, throws a pick, but honestly, more importantly, what I want to be focusing in on is the split that we had with these receivers where you had Deontay Johnson get back to 13 targets. Deontay Johnson being that wide receiver that is a straight up target hog for a full PBR format. But still, hell, George Biggins ended up being the wide receiver one here. George Biggins off of only eight targets still managed to have six receptions, 83 receiving yards. More importantly, the number one thing we need to be looking at Najee Harris versus Jalen Warren. Y'all know I was not a big Najee guy coming into the season. We are saying don't drop Najee Harris in the first when you can get David Montgomery in the fifth or the sixth. They're the same guy. They're not great athletes. They're in piss poor offenses, but they project to see a lot of volume. I was not a big Najee Harris fan, but this week, I mean, people were asking us Najee Harris versus Curtis Samuel, Najee Harris versus Kareem Hunt. I found myself starting it, but he gets outstepped by Jalen Warren, 38 to 37. <clears throat> a year ago, Najee Harris would play every single down. It wouldn't matter what the score is. Now, of course, the majority of these snaps came in the fourth quarter from Jalen Warren. Like when the game was completely blown out. But Najee Harris was the only Pittsburgh Steelers starter to get benched. The receivers were still out there. So I don't know. This can be something they have to look for this week with what Mike Tomlin's going to be saying because obviously Najee Harris has been horrendous. It hasn't just been this week to see Najee Harris disappoint on a per-touch basis and also just from a fantasy football context. He's been garbage. Now going over to our next lesson learned, let's... Let's head over to New Orleans. First off, let me flex on everyone saying, oh, I'm so happy. We went through, told everyone to buy Alvin Kamara low. Like Alvin Kamara, still Alvin Kamara. I mean, the man leads the New Orleans Saints are receiving six receptions, 91 receiving yards, has over 100 rushing yards, has 23 carries. It's not like it was a game that just won you your matchup outright. The reason for this, 
Taysom freaking Hill. I mean, I I don't know what to do. Look at the underlying numbers with Taysom Hill. Maybe my brain's broken. Maybe I just need to look at Taysom Hill scores points. You put Taysom Hill in your starting lineup. He's eligible at tight end, as we all know. And the only tight ends that are productive in fantasy football are Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, and, and that's it. Taysom Hill only had three routes run compared to Juwan Johnson, who played pretty much double the snaps. But it doesn't matter. Nine carries, 112 rushing yards, three rushing touchdowns, and he throws a passing touchdown just for the hell of it. Taysom Hill, four touchdowns. He's a must-start guy every single week going forward. I am embarrassed to admit that I have not been starting Taysom Hill. Clearly, it is laughable, laughable for me to be saying to avoid him. Now, going over to our next situation, let's go over to Washington. With Washington, Brian Roberts comes back. Very exciting. Antonio Gibson, technically the starter. Who the hell cares? I mean, the same thing happened that we've been saying is going to happen all season. When Brian Robinson comes back, the reason you needed to be selling Antonio Gibson a month ago when you could have still had something is it would be a running back by committee in one of the worst offenses in the NFL where three guys are splitting a workload and none of them are going to be startable. Now, of course, Brian Robinson was on a snap count. It was his first week back in. The coaching staff coming into this game said, yeah, he's going to be active, but we're not going to run him out there fully. So, with that being said, you had 18 snaps for Brian Robinson, 20 snaps for Antonio Gibson, 26 snaps for J.D. McKissick. Looks like they really have no plans to use Brian Robinson as a pass catcher in particular. Now, with Brian Robinson, I still think that he is upside to be a running back two in fantasy. I think that if you see Brian Robinson excel over Antonio Gibson, I would not be too surprised to see the Washington coaching staff go, Okay, well, Gibson, my man, you're on special teams. It's going to be a two-man backfield between Brian Robinson and J.D. McKissick. But there's still an outside chance that even if Brian Robinson overtakes Antonio Gibson as the starter, which is entirely possible, that could easily happen. If Brian Robinson's the starting running back here where, say, Antonio Gibson steals three to four carries per game, on top of this, J.D. McKissick is the exclusive passing down running back. I don't know if any of these RBs in Washington will be startable. So if anything, I'm probably actually going to go through and look to move off Brian Robinson. We'll talk about our sell high running backs later on in the week. Let's go over to our next situation. Miami, super simple. Raheem Boaster, must start guy now. I mean, once we get to a back, once we get Teddy B back, if we have anybody, anybody but Skylar freaking Thompson at quarterback, Reem will be a must-start RB. He had over 100 rushing yards this week. He had the rushing touchdown. What's very surprising is he came very close to seeing 20 carries. Y'all know with Reem Mostert, one of my favorite stats in fantasy football is he's a 30-year-old running back where you've seen one game in his NFL career with 20 more carries. He almost gets there this week. And if you're looking at the snaps, Mostert goes through, plays 46 snaps compared to Miles Gaskin at 13, Chase Edmonds at 10. He's the locked and loaded starter. He had three targets as well. Sticking with this team, I know we're going to have some people asking us about Jalen Waddle. I thought Jalen Waddle was this must-start guy. I thought that we shouldn't be worrying too much about the groin injury. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did not know that Teddy Bridgewater was going to go down the first play. Teddy Bridgewater's not a great quarterback, but he's a hell of a lot better than Skyler freaking Thompson. At least Teddy Bridgewater has been that longtime starter at the NFL level. So honestly, from a passing down standpoint, I don't think we can take too much away from anything in Miami outside of Raheem Mostert in particular. But now let's go over to the Seattle Seahawks where I'm going to double down on this. I understand Geno Smith looked great. Geno Smith yet again looking literally like he's just Russell Wilson. That's and, and what it looks like. He looks like he's Brian Russell Wilson in Seattle, really making it look like Pete Carroll was the mastermind behind this operation all along. Where you had Geno Smith, three passing touchdowns, over 10 yards per passing attempt as well. You had Tyler Lockett with the big game. You had DK Metcalf with the big game. Geno Smith continuing to play incredible football. However, very similar to what we said with Jared Goff, 
I may take some heat for it right now. Geno Smith, Geno Smith, guys. Uh, let's not go through. Let's not act like this is a quarterback that you can be playing every single week, rest of season. Maybe if he had some rushing upside, then sure, but he doesn't run the ball. But someone who does run the ball in this offense looks like Kenneth Walker, full blown league winning running back here. If you're able to get him off the waiver wire, of course, we'll be diving a little bit more to Kenneth Walker in our waiver wire video. But just to let you know, my top two running backs drafted on underdog this year. Or Josh Jacobs, because you could get the man in the seventh freaking round. And Kenneth Walker, because you could get him in the double-digit rounds. Okay, let's roll. Let's roll with Walker. Now, going over to our next rookie running back, Brees Hall. Okay, can we just bask in some glory here? Brees Hall coming out, 18 carries, 97 rushing yards. Brees Hall, I mean, I'm a little disappointed with this. Y'all know, I've been talking about Brees Hall being an incredible passing down running back. We saw someone that we took the over on two and a half receptions on underdog fantasy this weekend. I thought it was my favorite bet of the week on underdog two and a half receptions for we saw. Well, he only gave us two, but with those two receptions, a hundred receiving yards. We saw essentially had 200 total yards this game. I know one was pretty much a bust to play. I, I don't care. Almost 200 total yards for we saw. I couldn't be more excited. It's frustrating to say the least that Michael Carter had a couple of rushing touchdowns here. It is what it is though. Now going over to our next situation. I mean, here in Houston, Damian Pierce is a man like D Damian Pierce is him. I wasn't a big Damian Pierce fan. I was like, okay, not a great pass catcher and a piss poor offense. I don't want anything to do with Houston. It doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. The Houston Texans can still be garbage while Damian Pierce goes out there, 26 carries, 99 rushing yards, running people over on top of this with Damian Pierce. Five targets out of the backfield. He is now more involved as a pass catcher than Rex Burkett as well. Full-blown Damian Pierce breakout, must-start guy every single week. We will continue to move him up in our rankings, or we are definitely way too low on Brees Hall over the past two weeks. Now, going over, looking at another situation that we need to talk about will be the split backfield in Jacksonville. So you have Travis Etienne actually seeing more and more looks now where Travis Etienne is a running back coming through, playing 40 snaps compared to James Robinson at 30. Now, what's very interesting is, hell, it's the same exact situation that we've had previously. James Robinson is the short area running back. They're on the one-yard line, the two-yard line, if it's, Third and one, third and two, James Robinson is that guy. However, if it's an obvious passing down scenario, they're getting Travis Etienne out there. Travis Etienne ran 30 routes. He's heavily involved as a pass catcher. He was efficient as a rusher as well. We said this a lot this past week, but it's way too early to give up on Travis Etienne. And that, come on. Coming into the week, he'd only played four NFL games in his career. Now's the fifth. I think we are starting to see this breakout. Lower James Robinson down, bump up ETN. I mean, in theory, this should have been a phenomenal game for James Robinson. I thought this was the perfect matchup going up against the Houston Texans. I mean, I heard that the Houston Texans have won nine straight over Jacksonville. How the hell does that even happen? But it's all God for you. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please go down there. Drop a like on the video. Subscribe to the channel. Go take advantage of the Darren Waller under five receptions player prop for Monday night. Of course, link in the description, link in the live chat. Underdog Fantasy available at damn near every single state. Available in Canada, not Ontario. And when you sign up with promo code Flock, they'll match your first deposit dollar for dollar up to 100. And you can go take that Darren Waller under. Last but not least, go to the comment section. Let me know what your record is. Okay, I know you play in a lot of leagues. Let me know what your record is in that one league that you care most about because everybody has that league. Thank you again. I appreciate you. Hope you have a great night and hope we get to see you in the video tomorrow.